Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 130 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author and PR consultant and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content events and training platform providing success strategies for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. Now, just quickly before we jump into the main part of the show, I wanted to let you know about my online PR course and group coaching program, Vegans in the Limelight. Now, this is a 12-month online program where you have video training that teaches you everything you need to know about how to do your own PR. You can ask questions on the platform and you can also post your proposed pitches and media releases before sending them to journalists to get my feedback. You also get to jump on a monthly live group call where you can ask whatever questions you want about your business and you can get tailored help from me on anything to do with raising the profile of your brand. So it might be that I look at your website and give you some feedback or how to improve your LinkedIn profile and other marketing and PR topics. So if you'd like to find out more about that, just hop on over to veganbusinessmedia.com and you'll see a link there for Vegans in the Limelight. And now on to the main part of the show. In this episode, I interview Callie Ackland, founder of Bestowed Essentials, a wholesale distributor, online marketplace and zero waste retail store selling ethical, vegan and eco-friendly home goods in Rapid City, South Dakota. Callie founded the company three years ago at the age of 23 while still on active duty in the US Navy. A zero waste activist, Callie also hosts the popular Hippie Haven podcast, a free weekly resource on sustainable living. She also travels the US in a self converted camper van, hosting zero waste workshops, trash cleanups, and speaking at events such as the World Holistic Expo and Des Moines Vegan Fest. Callie is currently working on her first book, Starting a Zero Waste Business Everything I Wish I'd Known. In this episode, Callie discusses how and why she transitioned from working as a translator in the military to starting a zero-waste business, the pros and cons of running a business from a camper van, why she chose South Dakota, which is not renowned for being vegan-friendly, to open her first retail store, how she keeps the manufacturing process for her products sustainable, what zero waste really means and tips on how you can start to run your vegan business on these principles and much more. Here's the interview with Callie Ackland from Bestowed Essentials. Hello Callie, thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. So you've got a very interesting story. I mean, everyone has an interesting story, obviously, who I interview, but I, I was particularly interested in yours and your, your pitch caught my attention because not only do you run a vegan business, you also run a zero waste business and you run it from uh, traveling around uh, the country in your van. Um, so I'm really interested uh, yeah, to dig into your, your story, Kelly. So first of all, tell us the why, because that's what I like to kick off with everyone. Why do you do what you do? And I guess that's going to be mixed in with you telling us a bit about your journey from I believe you were a translator working in the military to starting your own vegan and zero waste business so tell us how it came about and your why yes my why I'm so incredibly passionate about the environment and trying to do everything that we can um, to protect the planet and you know something that's not talked about a lot in environmentalism is protecting the future of the human race as well. So to me, this environmentalism and veganism, they go hand in hand. You know, so many people, myself included, go vegan for the ethical reasons. And I think that is incredibly important. But there's also that environmental, environmentalism part of veganism and how animal agriculture is so, so detrimental to the environment. So when I was starting my business, it was really important to me from the start to make sure that all of our products are completely vegan and cruelty free. So they've got no animal products, no animal testing whatsoever. And that includes 
the entire supply chain up and down. So none of the raw ingredients tested on animals, um, none of the finished products, all of that. And my company, it's called Bestowed Essentials. And it is a wholesale manufacturer, a popular online marketplace, and the first zero waste home goods store in South Dakota. We sell ethical and eco-friendly home goods that help you reduce your trash and your impact on the planet. And, um, you know, when I first started it, I was 23. It was two and a half years ago. I was uh, I was in the U.S. Navy as an Arabic translator, oh. um, doing that full time. And, and this was just kind of a, a side hobby for me. I started making my own natural soaps, bars of soap. And um, it's just evolved so much from there. You know, I really found this passion um, this enjoyment in soap making as, as a hobby outside of my military career. And I was making so much soap and, and giving it all away to my friends. And they were just overwhelmed. They're like, okay, we have, we have like enough soap for a couple of years now. Like we're, we're good. Um, everybody I knew had a whole bunch of dozens of bars. And, and so several of my friends had suggested that I started selling on Etsy. So I, I did. I started selling on Etsy and I started doing the local farmer's market uh, on my days off from the Navy. Um, and it really just grew from there and went from just being soaps to being a variety of different like beauty and cosmetic products. And now we've expanded to home goods and cleaning supplies. And so we're not only making our own products and wholesaling them to other stores around the U.S. But then we also now have um, a, a retail store in Rapid City, South Dakota, where we're selling our own products and then also selling products that, that complement our own line uh, from other small businesses, especially oh. female-owned small businesses, as much as possible from Fantastic. here in the U.S. Wow, that's amazing. So that's a big leap, isn't it? I mean, we hear people having yeah. various transitions, say, from, you know, the corporate world to running their own business, but to, yeah, to go from being a military translator in the Navy to, to running your own business, that's a, a big leap. Um, and, and it's interesting, I noticed you talked about how you, you know, you started out as a hobby and, and then you did farm farmers markets um, and now you've obviously had you know you're, you've got this this business um, full time so let's talk about a little bit about the challenges so when you were first starting out what were were some of the challenges and how did you handle them Ooh, when I was first starting out um, I was stationed in Georgia in a, a rural part of southern United States and um, here I was this young very hippie girl and I was selling all natural vegan cruelty free <laughs> products and you know where I was selling was not interested in what I was selling whatsoever so the farmers market that I was going to it wasn't profitable for me um, you know it wasn't financially sustainable to keep going to that because just the 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 people in that area just weren't weren't on board with what my vision was and so that was a really big thing was um and has continued to be a really big thing actually is is education and just talking to people like i said we started out with a lot of like bath beauty body type products and so first it was educating people on some of the really toxic, dangerous chemicals that are in our, our skincare products, what we're putting on our skin and how it can affect us in ways that we don't think about when we're buying stuff off the, the supermarket shelf. Mm. Um, and then as we've moved into other products and, and cleaning supplies and that kind of thing and really, really um, like honed in on uh, environmentalism as, as our passion as um, our driving factor. Um, now it's a lot of education on plastic pollution and veganism, of course, um, still talking about unsafe ingredients and in our, our cleaning products and our food and our, our beauty products. And so education has been hard, you know, talking to people and, and just, just trying to share with them why we're doing what we're doing, why, why we feel it's so important and, yeah. and why hopefully they'll take it seriously too. For sure. Now you mentioned that the first farmer's market you went to wasn't sustainable, wasn't financially sustainable. So what did you do then as your next step? I understand you continued the education, but I'm just curious of how you went from starting out, you know, as, as a, a farmer's market to being where you are now. So how did that growth kind of come about? 
So I realized that, yeah, like I said, it wasn't, wasn't the right fit of where I was currently living. And so I really started to focus on our online marketing effort efforts, um, growing our Etsy shop, starting our own website to be able to sell direct to consumer all across the country Uh, um, and just kind of widening that, that target audience to from our, that one small town to anyone across the U S who, who found us online. Got it. Got it. Now that makes sense. That makes sense. So you grew the online business to become successful. Yeah. And one, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and um, I've asked a, a couple of people around this, is with vegan and environmentally you know, sustainable and, and high quality materials uh, or ingredients in, in your case, they can often be more expensive because, especially for a small business, you're not able to get those bulk uh, purchase discounts. So I'm curious how you handle that in terms of how you, uh, you know, market and sell your products. Like, do, do you put them at a higher price range and then say, okay, this is why they're more expensive, or have you found a way to keep them more affordable? I'm just curious how you you handle that side of things. For us, accessibility is so important. We don't want to price our products with a really high profit margin so that they're only available to a certain set of people um, because that prevents so many people from being able to take these first steps into a more compassionate, ethical, eco-friendly lifestyle. So we try to keep our profit margins as low as possible, our price point as low as possible, while still being able to to continue to grow, of course. Um, and so we do a little bit of both, you know, we keep it low, but we also explain, uh, you know, what the ingredients are that we're using, why we chose them, why the, the prices are where they are. Um, and then something that we just started doing this year was doing for Earth Day, which is in April, mm-hmm. um, doing a pay what you can sale. And that's something oh, that we'll okay. be continuing to do. Um, each, each earth day from here on out is the plan, um, to really help make our products as accessible as possible. And so we completely just open our website up, our current inventory, and we let people choose what price that they can or want to pay for the products. Wow. And, and how do you find that people react to that? Because my instinct, I guess my instant reaction, maybe it's because I'm a journalist and maybe that was like natural cynicism is that uh, people are <laughs> going to take advantage of that and like, you know, maybe pay 50 cents or a dollar and, and that could, you know, because that's quite a risky thing. To, it's a bold thing to do and I love it, but it's yeah. quite risky as well for your financial bottom line. So what's been the reaction so far? And how have people, you know, have some people maybe paid a bit more to make up for those that, that can't pay? How, how has that worked? Yeah, exactly. So it was terrifying to, <laughs> to launch that this last April. Um, I was really scared. I was like, I maybe this is going to like ruin my business. Um, yeah. But it was, it really, you know, the way that people came together, um, because we had an option to pay it forward. And so people could, um, pay because they can they can pay what they want so they could pay way more than what the product is normally priced at or what they could do is they could also just pay um extra to go towards someone else's purchase without actually making a purchase of their own and it was incredible the amount of people that we saw who who took advantage of that that pay it forward and were paying for other people's purchases without even getting a single thing for themselves and so I we love did. that. I'm getting goosebumps when you're telling me that. It's just so lovely. It just sort of restores faith in human nature. I like. I love that. It was, and we <laughs> did see. We did see a lot of orders that were very, 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 very low priced, um, and we did. We did lose money from it, which is what we were expecting. We lost less money than we were expecting, so I considered mm-hmm. that a win. Um, and the other thing that was really amazing was the the dozens of messages that we got from people thanking us of that they had always wanted to try our products that they've been following us forever but they just couldn't afford it we we heard so many messages from people who had lost their job and been unemployed for six months who are struggling to pay rent. And, you know, when you're struggling to meet those bare minimum needs, you can't afford to buy anything extra. And so these, you know, the the messages that we got from people, just the gratitude, the outpour of gratitude from people who were able to buy cleaning products and, and, and 
beauty products, you know, when you're going through a hard time, it can be nice just to have that, that little treat come in the mail that, that puts a smile on your face. And so Absolutely. that definitely, that alone made it worth it to us. Oh, that's wonderful. And I guess as well, and it, and it was a great, I guess, marketing and PR exercise for you as well. And because you're coming from a genuine place as well. Um, so I can imagine that was beneficial that way. And, and like you said, you expected to, to lose money because I'm guessing with shipping as well, like if people are paying were people paying what they wanted for the product, but then they still had to pay a base shipping or was, did that include the shipping as well? No, they did still have to pay shipping. Oh, okay. Normally we okay. offer free shipping off, um, if off an order of $40 or more, but for this specific sale, we closed that down and, and people did have to pay the exact amount of shipping themselves. Cool. That makes sense. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, otherwise that could really, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> that could really kind of send you over the edge. But I love that. I think that's a, a fantastic initiative. That's great. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so you mentioned that. So you grew the online business um, and then you opened your physical location. And I'm curious because you picked South Dakota. Now, I've never been there, but I know a little bit about, you know, the politics of the US. And South Dakota is not known for being vegan friendly, as far as I'm aware. So I'm curious, especially after your experiences in Georgia with the farmer's market, that you picked South Dakota to open your your retail store. So tell us a bit about, um, well, first of all, tell us how did you get to a point where you knew you were ready to and uh, be able to open a physical store? Because that's a whole lot of extra expense, what with having a permanent location, of course. Um, So when did you know you were ready and why did you pick South Dakota? (laughs) So the brief of it, I was not ready and I did not pick South Dakota for a retail <laughs> oh, store. Oh, okay. Go on, tell me. So <laughs> it just happened. So, so what it was is after my entire first year of, of starting the business, I was still on active duty. When I got out of the military, a big dream of mine had always been to be able to travel the country in a camper van. And so I did that and I took my business on the road with me and I was actually making products in my van at the time. I was making soap. I was making our beauty products. Let me tell you, that was a giant logistical hassle for I sure. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was a hassle. I did that for about eight months. Um, the first eight months of 2018. And then I just definitely couldn't keep doing it in the van. And I was um, also, I was working on a political campaign. And so I got a, I rented a storage unit. It was a hundred square foot storage unit. And I was working out of there for three months. And then as soon as the 2018 midterm elections were over, um, I packed everything up back into the van and headed straight to South Dakota. And I had chosen South Dakota for a production studio space because South Dakota is one of the, the best states in the country for small businesses. They have a lot of great tax breaks. They're also very friendly to full-time nomads for my own personal taxes um, and dealing with the hassles of you know not having one permanent home address. Um, and then they also just have a very low cost of living and they also are centrally located within the U.S. So, so shipping to and from both coasts is more affordable than, mm-hmm. say, being on one of the coasts. Um, so I was going up to South Dakota. The plan was to open a production shop there to make all of our products. And when I got there, you know, I needed to find a space quickly. My budget was very limited. At the time, it was still it was just me and a virtual assistant who was helping me. Um, And so I got there and the only place that I could find that was available right away and in my budget was this little 600 square foot shop in this, you know, like a, the industrial warehousey part of town, definitely like off the beaten track away from the the popular downtown area. Um, And so, you know, I got it because November of last year, that space was huge to us. I was like, Oh my, you know, going from a camper van, which is like 500 (laughs) square feet to a hundred square feet storage unit to the 600 square feet space. I was like, this is so big. It's amazing. This is going to work perfectly. And that, that production space, it had a small, um, front room. And, you know, I was like, Oh, well, I, I don't even need this for production. Why not? put our finished products on the shelf and let local customers come in and and pick stuff up and and shop if they want to. We already have this space. We're already paying rent. We don't need this front space. Let's give this a shot because the the goal was to open a retail store someday in like another year or two in a different town. And so, yeah, um, did that. And we, oh my gosh, as soon as, as soon as we got into that space, 
Um, I hired a full-time operations manager to help me with production and things have just absolutely taken off since November. We've completely outgrown that spot. And we just, uh, last week we signed a lease on a new, um, 1700 square foot space that's in the heart of downtown. So we'll kind of be doing the same thing again as we're still, um, figuring out the finances and getting, getting a hang of having a retail store. So the back of it is going to be for production and the front is a retail space. Um, and I'm, that's great. I'm so excited about that. Yeah. So, and that's interesting. So uh, you're doing your own production, so you're not, um, mm-hmm. outsourcing or co-packing. You're actually, you've got your own production team. Is that yep. right? Wow. That's great. Why did you yeah, choose do. to do that rather than going with a co-packer? Oh, well, you know, 100% honest, it's because I'm a perfectionist and <laughs> um, I wanted to be able to control it myself. So I just, it's, this business is, you know, my baby pretty much. Like I've put so much of myself into it. It was really hard for me first to just to, to turn over the, the handmade production myself because I was the one doing it for so long. So just mm-hmm. giving it to somebody else to do was hard enough. Um, I, I didn't want to turn it over to another company. I wanted it to stay in house. And, um, you know, I'm really glad that I've made that decision. Did you have to invest? We have in place. Yeah. Amazing. Did you have to invest in quite a lot of equipment? Because I'm guessing with a production facility where you're manufacturing, that's kind of a whole different ball game from, as you say, making soaps in the back of your camper van. So Mm -hmm. was there quite a lot of investment into equipment in the, for the production facility? Um, we've actually only spent about a thousand dollars on equipment. So we've tried to oh, source wow. going along with our environmentalism values. We've tried to source as much secondhand as possible. And then we do still do a lot of stuff by hand. Mm. So a lot of mixing and, and blending and that kind of stuff. We're doing it by hand. Um, in the future, as, as we're continuing to rapidly grow, we are going to be looking into early next year increasing so with our, our equipment so that we can make bigger batches at a time. But sure. the ahead. goal is for it to always be handmade because I think it gives it that special extra touch when it's made by hand by a real person who is passionate about what they're doing versus you know just being done on a machine on a factory line. Got it. Got it. Just going back to the eight months in the van, just out of curiosity. So I know you said obviously that was challenging. What what was, I guess, what were some of the pros and cons? Because I've actually interviewed, I don't know if you know, Andy Tabar from Compassion Company who makes t-shirts and uh, he runs a lot of his business. He travels a lot in his van and it essentially kind of runs uh, the business while traveling. So I'm kind of curious about that, that lifestyle. What are the pros and cons? Uh, you know, looking back, I really can't think of any pros. It was um, <laughs> kind enough. of a really, it was a really naive decision to make thinking that I'd be able to to do it all in the van because um, there there's plenty of cons. The The primary, primary one being storage, you know, as, as demand was increasing, I didn't have the space to be able to to make more product because the, the storage in here is so limited. Um, and then the other thing was shipping, you know, getting ingredients Mm. in, sending orders out. That was a a nightmare to try to handle. Um, yeah, but at the time I was just so excited about being out of the military and being able to set off on my dream of traveling. And this is how I was going to pay for it. And, you know, it, it worked for the time and I'm, I'm glad we've moved on from there. Yeah, got it, got it. No, I think it's probably good, that nomadic lifestyle. It's, it's particularly good, I guess, for people who maybe do services in particular. Because yes. you just, you've just got your laptop. Like I work with a laptop. As long as I've got my laptop with me, I can plonk an internet, then I can pretty much do what I need to do. But I can imagine, like you said, with making, especially making the products, I'm so impressed that you actually made them in the back of your van. I've got this image now. <laughs> and then shipping them. I mean, that was, that was pretty amazing. It was very, very cool. Um, um, so let's talk a little bit about your customers. So they're in South Dakota is where your physical store is. Obviously, your online customers come from across the uh, across the US. But out of curiosity, I mean, I don't know if you've done any kind of, you know, or even just anecdotal, uh, uh, approximately how many of them seek you out because you're a vegan business uh, or an environmental business versus people who are just kind of more interested in the environmental side or the natural side? So um, my data comes from Instagram story polls. So it's not (laughs) highly, you know, specific data. 
Um, but about 25% of our customer base is actually vegan. Um, I would say definitely people, uh, our customers come to us because we're a low waste plastic free company more so than because we're a vegan company. Right. Okay. Okay, cool. No, that's, that's useful to know. Cool. Um, and so in terms of the products, how do you decide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the vegan and the marketing side in a minute, but I just want to talk to you a little bit about the products that you make, particularly as you're scaling up. How do you decide what products to make? So you started out with soap and then beauty care, and now you've moved into cleaning products. So how do you decide um, yeah, which products to make? Customer demand actually is, is our number one. We Um, I, I particularly, I love to interact with our customers, especially on Instagram, um, and, and trying to involve them in steps of the process and behind the scenes of running the business as much as possible. And I think that's part of why, um, we've been successful so far is because people feel like they're, they're really getting that behind the scenes look and and they know each member of the team individually and, and they get to see these peaks of how we're making stuff. And so, you know, people ask us, we ask our customers what they want, and we have a a whole running list of potential future products. And and we go through and we work on recipes and formulas and and see what the demand is. And we test things and some things get scrapped and and never thought of again. And some things um, turn out to be huge successes. Mm. So it's definitely coming from our customers. Great. First very, and foremost. Yeah, very smart. Very smart. And how many staff, you mentioned team members, how many staff have you got now? I've got four employees right now. So we're still very, very small, but um, we'll be hiring another um, employee this year and then hopefully a sixth one at the beginning of next year is the goal. Got it. And I guess you've done that kind of gradually as you've, as the business has increased and the income has increased or the turnover has increased. And then you've, you've made the decision to, to hire people sustainably, I guess, to keep the business sustainable. Cause I know hiring staff is a major expense, especially if they're not contractors, they're actually employees. Yes, it is a huge expense. So it's really been, you know, as we can financially afford it um, and just kind of seeing what makes the most sense to pass off to another person and what makes more sense to for me or or for you know like my operations manager to keep doing since we have the most experience with it yeah so you've got an operations manager so what were your as you've only got such a, a small number of employees at the moment what were your next hires your first one was operations manager what were your next um hires after that so my first one was actually uh, my brand manager, Nicole. She started okay. off just kind of my virtual assistant. She works remotely. Um, well, her home base is New Jersey, but like me, she's pretty nomadic and travels pretty often. Um, she helps me produce my podcast. She helps do updates to the website. She helps. Um, I do speaking and consulting as well uh, outside of Bestowed Essentials, and she helps me plan and coordinate those sort of engagements. Um, and then Cheska, my operations manager, was the second hire. She is the one who's actually in Rapid City, South Dakota, making all of the products by hand herself and, and running our retail store. And then we've got um, Alexandria is our product photographer, as well as our um, Salem event manager, Salem. Salem, Oregon, because we're going to be opening a retail st- retail store there oh. in the next year and a half. So wow. we're slowly gearing up. We're doing events. We're working with the local community to raise awareness. And so um, she's really spearheading that in a local community and getting that going. And then once the store is open, she'll be the store manager there. And then um, finally, we have Courtney in Rapid City as well. And she's our shipping assistant. Um, so her, her job is, is just getting online orders packaged up and out the door. Wonderful. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that because I think it can be quite tricky for people to know who to hire and, and when. So I, I think it was really good to just get a nice little insight there. So yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so in terms of um, marketing and PR, I know you mentioned Instagram stories. What, have, um, what are some of the marketing strategies that you, you've used and you continue to use that you found to be most effective in, in gaining customers? Mm. So I don't know anything about marketing and we don't have any sort of like official 
PR plans or anything like that. It's all been completely grassroots learn as we go. Instagram has been by and by far the biggest platform for us. Um, about 70% of our sales come through Instagram, which is oh, huge. Wow. Um, oh. And so that's where, since we're getting such high conversion from it, that's where we focus most of our attention. And that's just, um, you know, like I said, engaging with our customers using video and Instagram story and Instagram lives to take people behind the scenes, to answer their questions, to, to be transparent about what we're doing. Um, and then the other thing that, that has been really, really successful for us is working with a variety of different micro influencers on Instagram. So especially since we're so heavily involved in the zero waste field, um, and that's really where we've niched down, we've worked with a lot of very small, like five to 10,000 follower micro influencers in that zero waste field who are trusted and known among their followers. and um, yeah, doing doing collaborations and campaigns with them, and and that drives a lot of traffic and conversion for us as well. That's great, and that's good that you pointed that out to the the use of micro influencers, like you say, between five to ten thousand followers. Because I think there's this myth that oh, if you're going to work with an influencer, it must be someone with at least you know a hundred thousand or two hundred and fifty thousand or a million, uh, you know, followers. But that's not necessarily <laughs> yeah. the case. So I think that that's right. What you I love what you said about they they may have those those smaller followings, but they are trusted um, yes. by their audiences. And I think that's really quite key. Um, so I'm really glad that you raised that and that that's been yeah successful for you yeah and every business is going to be different of course um for us we we did try working with a few larger influencers between like um 50 to 150,000 followers and we didn't see anywhere close to the same conversion rates as wow. we did with those micro influencers so Interesting. You know, we're following really? the numbers and yeah. sticking with what works for us. That's really good to know. And I think that, and like you say, every business is different. Of course, some are going to be great with, you know, those massive audiences. But uh, I really like the fact that you've had success with these smaller uh, micro influencers. So I really appreciate you sharing that. In terms of the word vegan then, in your marketing materials, on your website and in general promotion, and it's interesting because I know you said the majority of your customers are actually more interested in the natural and the zero waste environmental side of things. But just out of curiosity, but what are your what's your strategy in terms of using the word vegan or not um, in terms of your branding and marketing? Oh, yeah, it's really it really depends on who you're marketing towards in that instance. So for our existing retail store in South Dakota and, and for the one that we're going to be moving into and expanding um, this fall, we don't use the word vegan very much because of the uh, the local audience where we're at. They're not yeah. concerned about that. And in fact, for, you know, we're kind of, we're in cattle country. And yeah, so for I was thinking people, South Dakota, it could be, yeah, uh, puts them off. Oh, the vegans are coming. <laughs> it does, it does. You right. know, vegans have a very bad rap to some people in that area. And so the word vegan can be very off-putting. So that's not a word that we use in our, our local marketing for the retail store. Now, for online and for wholesale, we do use the word vegan definitely. You know, it really helps us stand out from similar businesses on the market because we are 100% vegan and we're committed to that. And, you know, I'm vegan. Um, all of my employees are um, vegetarian or working towards, you know, primarily plant based. So, you know, it's not just a marketing term, it really is like a lifestyle for us. And, and so when, appropriate we we do definitely use the term because it's something that we take to heart but you have to know your audience and, and who you're talking yeah, to and absolutely. kind of change up your wording absolutely do you use it much on your website on the bestowed essentials website um it does like all the the products pages the product descriptions will say it and it's in our about thing but we don't have any like it's big like, flashing yeah, vegan yeah, sign on the homepage. page got it yeah. no that makes sense interesting i just want to touch on that you said you were going to open in salem oregon why not portland which is super vegan friendly um well you know it's pretty much just because salem is my hometown so. oh is it oh okay right Huh. Yeah, and there there is another there's a zero waste pop up in the Portland area. They don't have an actual brick and mortar store yet, but they do a lot of events. Um, oh, okay. And so, 
I'm really big on supporting other people in this niche, you know, community and collaboration over competition. Nice. And so there is Salem is a is a decent sized city. It's got it's very progressive and liberal and there's a very big market oh, for okay. vegan, natural, eco-friendly products. And so well we're, we're good in in Salem and I I don't want to go up into Portland where somebody's already trying to get established. You know, nice. I want to let them do their thing. Oh, that's great. No, I love that. I love that. It's fantastic. So you touched, um, I'm going to touch on something you said about wholesale. So as well as making your products and then selling them online, shipping them online across the country and also in your retail store and soon to be retail stores, you also wholesale them to other retailers. Can you tell us about a little bit about that side of the operation and how, how different it is and what, what's involved in that and any challenges, et cetera? Yeah. So yeah, we do B2B and B2C. Um, Wholesale has really taken off for us this year. Um, We're coming up on a hundred, our first hundred stockists around the U.S., which was a a really big goal for me. I'm excited to be reaching that. Um, And I would say the, the, the two reasons why wholesale has been so successful for us is that a, because, um, I, I myself already have a, a name here in the, the zero waste business industry. And so with my podcast and with um, doing speaking engagements and doing zero waste workshops and doing consulting with other eco entrepreneurs on how to start a zero waste store, um, I know almost every zero waste store owner in the, in the U.S. And so that... Um, existing connection has definitely helped getting our products into their stores um, since we already know each other personally. And then the other thing that's been big for us, um, because, you know, there's there's these existing ones, but then with all the stockists that, um, that we didn't already know ahead of time, we connected with them via this wholesale platform. It's called FAIR, F-A-I-R-E. And I believe they actually, like, two days ago just went international. They used to be just for U S makers and retailers, but they just expanded. Now they're, they're available for international makers and retailers. And that has been huge for us. Our very first month on fair, we made over $10,000 from wholesale alone, um, up from an average of, uh, $1,500. So you can see that was a huge jump. That's amazing. Wow. That's a massive jump. Fantastic. Fantastic. Huge. It was huge. I I love that you've got that collaboration going. And what I also love is like you mentioned, you're doing these workshops, you're doing these speaking engagements and consulting. And so, and I think that's a good example for people listening of if you've got like a a product-based business, you can still establish yourself as an expert in a particular field. um, And that can help your, it can also be a side bit or an additional income to your business. um, And it can also help to increase sales. um, And like you say, having the, the podcast as well. So I love that you've actually, yeah, managed to establish yourself as an expert in in that arena. One thing I wanted to ask you before we um, wrap up is, can you give us a few tips on how to start a zero waste business? Because I know that can be a challenge, like with the vegan side of things, that's enough of a challenge as it is like, you know, finding, you know, all the right products, ingredients, if you make certain products with glues, you know, finding animal free glues, like this whole thing that alone can be challenging. And I know that when we first came to, from the UK to Australia back in 2001, my partner, and I um, opened a, a vegan hair and beauty salon, and I was responsible for like, you know, finding all the products and the companies that were vegan. And I remember it was like, oh my gosh. So that in, in and of itself is quite tricky. But then you've got the whole, oh, okay, how can we be zero waste? How can we be you know, sustainable in our business? So could you perhaps give us your, your top few tips on, on how to go about starting and running a zero waste business? I know we could probably do a whole episode on that, but just oh, a yeah. few little tips to, to kind of give people some ideas. And obviously we'll link to, to your, um, your business and your consulting for those who want to, to take that further. But what, what are your few little tips on, on how people can do that? Well, vendor and supplier re, uh, relationships are so important. And that's, you know, that's how it is in any business. Um, but especially if you're wanting to do a zero waste plastic free business, um, because that's going to be a huge potential source of trash for your business behind the scenes is just getting stuff in from your suppliers. And so building that connection with them, working with them on changing 
packaging their packaging, how they're shipping things to you. Um, that's that's probably just the the first and most important thing. That is where I see the most trash coming in. And but you know, zero waste. The name can be so confusing um, because zero waste is about more than just the waste that you're producing or you're not producing. It's all about trying to live your life without harming people or animals or the planet and, and doing the best you can as often as you can. And so it's not, not just about like, oh, great, you know, you got these products, these supplies shipped to you without extra plastic bags and wrappers and bubble wrap and air pockets and all that. They, they were willing to work with sustainable paper, cardboard, whatever sort of packaging. Um, but, you know, how far away are your suppliers? How far did those that box travel to reach your store? Who made the, the you know, who processed the ingredients or who made the product that you're reselling? Um, was it done sustainably? Was it good for the planet? Of, of course, you know, veganism, is it free of animal products? Is it free of animal testing? Um, was it sustainably harvested? Are, are there replanting efforts? So, you know, it just totally depends on what your business is. It's mm -hmm. hard to make um, generalizations, but, and it's also, it, it can be very overwhelming to try to think about all these things, but I think it's so important. And I think it's our duty. Um, it's our, our responsibility as business owners to care about these things and to help take some of that burden off of our customers. Yeah. Um, you know, it should be on us to make sure that we're giving our customers the absolute best that we possibly can so that they can then go on and do their best and just continue that ripple effect, you know, with the overall goal, overall goal of not hurting people, not hurting animals and not hurting the planet. Got it. So zero waste doesn't necessarily mean you're producing absolutely zero waste in your business, or does it? Or no. does it mean that you're on Because that, I mean, that's where Not they could be. A yeah, it, it, is, it is. It's so confusing. So low waste is a, is a more uh, acceptable term, I guess, or a oh, more okay. understandable term. Um, it is impossible for any one person or any one business to make absolutely zero trash whatsoever. Right. Um, you know, we, we live in a linear economy, not a circular economy. Waste is a design flaw and it's there. And, you know, we should be doing the best we can to redesign these systems yes. and these functions. Um, but no, zero, zero trash, zero waste is impossible, but it's about making as little of an impact as you can. So for us, we send an average of 10 pounds of trash to the landfill every month in our production studio. And how would um, that compare to say a standard business that's on a similar party or a similar size, but that perhaps isn't that interested in environment or waste? What, what would they approximately send to landfill? Uh, the average would be probably similar size and concept would be about five pounds per day. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. So it's, you know, we're not perfect. Nobody, no business is perfect, but we do try the Absolutely. best we can. We're constantly, you know, we go through our trash. Some people think that sounds weird, <laughs> but we're constantly evaluating how we can do better. Um, and right now, actually, you know, we send 10, 10 pounds of trash to the landfill. We've actually been saving a lot of our trash too. And, and we're actually going to do a, a like team bonding weekend and make a whole bunch of sculptures out of our trash Lovely. instead of throwing it to the landfill to, to be able to decorate around the store. Aww. So that's, that's another way that we're really just trying to minimize our impact and start a conversation too. you know, customers will come in and, and see our trash and we can talk about it and have that transparent conversation. Brilliant. I love that. And I love those are really useful tips. And I think particularly, like you said, about working with suppliers about how they deliver packages, because I mean, uh, and I can imagine if there's more, I mean, it'd be great to educate people. I know it's like sometimes I order from like a big company and they'll send me like a small item in a great big box. And I'm like, oh, come on. I mean, okay, yeah. it's a paper box, <laughs> but I'm like, come on, you know, why couldn't you just get a smaller box? It was like such a waste. And of course, we will then, you know, obviously try and reuse the box or at least it can be recycled. But even so, it's, it, I think that's great to just even get those suppliers to start thinking along those lines. So I think those are some really helpful tips. And again, as I say, we'll um, send links to, to you for people who really want to, you know, get a handle on this that can hire you from consulting or hear you speak, etc. So it's been absolutely wonderful. So just finally, a final question before we wrap up. What are your, I know you've touched on a little bit about you're about to open the new retail store uh, in Oregon. What are you, what's your long-term vision? for Bestowed Essentials and for yourself? 
Long term. Um, well, yeah, you know, we're expanding in, in South Dakota later this year, really wanting to build up and uh, be a community center um, in our new space. In 2020, we're going to be doing a zero waste uh, pop up shop on wheels, actually, and, and taking our zero waste products all around the country to small rural areas where these aren't accessible otherwise. Um, Is that back in your, are you going to be back in your van for that? Yeah. yeah oh, lovely. The van, yeah, the van that I have right now, I'm just going to, you know, convert it again and, and do that. Um, twenty Very early 2021, the goal is January, um, opening up that second retail store in, in Salem. And then the goal from there, you know, for both me personally and for the business is I want to help other zero waste entrepreneurs start their own stores all over the country and all over the world. And I would like to, um, at some point turn, uh, bestowed essentials into a franchise and have our own, you know, multiple stores of our own mm -hmm. around the country. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I have a, a book that's, I'm working on it. I'm trying. I'm trying. I've got. So oh many yes, so I remember you sent me that on You're my right. plate. <laughs> so it's yes. coming up as well, and that's on how to start a zero waste business. It sure is exciting. Yes. And then I've been moving more into consulting on that as well. Like I've said, because there's such a huge demand, people wanting to know, you know, how I did it, what advice that I have, and um, speaking too. You know, I I do a lot of speaking already and, and plan to ramp that up even more, um, especially at vegan festivals, um, right. because these two issues go hand in hand and, you know, none of us are single issue people. We can all care about more than one thing. And, yeah. and so I think it's great to talk to people who are already passionate about one and, and talk to them about how they can be involved in the other. And then, um, and a just random last thing I'll throw out there. I also really want to plan a, a vegan fest of our own in South Dakota. I'd really like to, oh, yeah. to make South Dakota a more vegan friendly place. Cause there's definitely a lot of small businesses that don't have, um, you know, they don't, they, there's not a lot of awareness, but they are there. And so I'd really like to help contribute to, to making South Dakota a more vegan friendly place. Wonderful. I love it. I'm very yeah. excited. It's been so lovely speaking with you. I think it's fantastic because obviously, you know, we're all passionate and all the listeners are listening to the show. We're all passionate about veganism and, and everything, but you're right. They do go hand in hand. And I think when we can combine those two, you know, well, three people, animals, planet, with the natural ingredients as well, um, it's even better. So I'm really excited about what you do. And I say, we'll, we'll put links to, to everything, your podcast and the uh, bestowed essentials, but you've been really generous sharing your um insights and expertise, Kelly, and hopefully inspiring lots of listeners to implement more zero waste or low waste, whatever we call it, uh, principles into their business. So thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So that was Kelly Ackland from Zero Waste Company, Bestowed Essentials. You can find out more at bestowedessentials.com. And that link is on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts and going to episode 130. Now for some vegan business news highlights. Omnipork, a vegan pork alternative created by social venture Green Monday in Hong Kong, is continuing to gain traction in Asia with the announcement that Cathay Pacific has become the world's first airline to serve the product. The airline said on its website that the move is part of its commitment to creating the in-flight dining experiences of the future, and described Omnipork as being delicious in any recipe that traditionally uses real pork. Omnipork is a vegan blend of pea protein, non-GMO soy, shiitake mushrooms and rice that looks and tastes like animal-based pork. But unlike animal-based pork, Omnipork has zero milligrams of cholesterol, is cruelty-free, and it's 86% lower in saturated fat and 66% lower in calories. Cathay Pacific also noted that the plant-based product is more climate-friendly and better for health than animal-based pork. For the entire month of October 2019, business class passengers can enjoy Omnipork Bolognese with Garganelli Pasta on all long-haul flights departing from Hong Kong. 
The airline, which has been serving Beyond Meat's beef alternative in the Pier First Class Lounge at Hong Kong International Airport since October 2018, will review passenger satisfaction and continue to experiment with Omnipork dishes. It's fantastic to see Omnipork getting into the mainstream, especially in Asia. You may have seen the heartbreaking images of millions of pigs being killed due to an outbreak of swine flu in China. So taking animals off the menu and replacing them with plant-based alternatives is imperative. And of course, it's great to see a major airline being progressive and taking the lead on offering vegan dishes to passengers. Now, speaking of vegan proteins going mainstream, Hungry Jack's fast food chain in Australia recently launched a plant-based burger option. The chain is using a new plant-based protein created by V2 Foods, a new startup in collaboration with Australian Government Department CSIRO and seed funding provided by Competitive Foods Australia, which owns Hungry Jack's. Now, I went to the launch of V2 Foods in Sydney and I tasted the product in two dishes which were vegan. Unfortunately, the rest of the food offerings on the night were vegetarian, so I didn't get to sample those. Um, And it was tasty. While I was there, I met Jack Cowan, the founder of Hungry Jack's, and I asked him if the fast food chain would consider removing some animal products from the menu instead of just adding plant-based options. He was very honest and candid with me, telling me that the company is not brave enough yet to do that and that they simply wanted additional customers, so vegans, vegetarians and flexitarians. He said that Hungry Jack's is not on a mission and it was about business and profits. Now, while this is disappointing, he did note in his speech on the night that he was pleased to be part of the creation of a plant-based protein and that even he had been fooled in a taste test between animal-based beef and V2 Foods plant-based beef. The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Karen Andrews, who describes herself as a committed carnivore, has said that she thought the kofta dish that she tasted on the night was real lamb as it was so realistic. So it's good to see government and big business recognise the opportunities in the plant-based food sector, and it's clear that we have to continue to ensure that vegan food products taste incredible, and we have to encourage people to choose them over animal products so that the profits are in the plant-based ones. These large corporations may not be jumping on the vegan bandwagon or the plant-based bandwagon for the ethics, so we have to make ethics profitable. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a review and rating on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. Finally, I encourage you to head over to veganbusinessmedia.com where you can find more free resources as well as details of how we can work together to help you grow your vegan business. I'm Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. And I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now. 